society. So welcome to the um, symposium, a public symposium called Sustainability, where we ask the question, sustainability through trade agreements. And we want to ask that question and see um, answers to it along the case example of palm oil. And we have two experts who will uh, introduce that discussion and the topic to us. I briefly want to uh, introduce myself. My name is uh, Angelica Hilbeck. I am a, a senior lecturer and researcher at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. I am by training an agroecologist, so I'm not a lawyer or economist uh, that could um, have own expertise in this. But I have a great interest in these uh, in these issues, and it is uh, the and I'm also a board member of Critical Scientists Switzerland, who are have organized and hosted this event tonight. But it's not only um, the Critical Scientists Switzerland who do this and organizes; it is also with the support of uh, other organizations like the Critical um, Lawyers, uh, a student organization of the University of Bern. And the event is supported and also uh, partly organized by the European Network of Scientists for Social and Environmental Responsibility, ENSO, of which I'm also a board member. And CSS is a member organization of that European Network of Critical Scientists. So this just for setting the stage and the scene, who the people are who organize this and uh, where we are located. So we are located for now in Switzerland, but we will move across the globe to the other side uh, of the globe actually, because we will tackle the question of whether sustainability can be reached through trade agreements along the case of palm oil and the trigger of that is that Switzerland currently is negotiating a trade agreement with Indonesia and as we all know palm oil production is a key uh, commodity that Indonesia is growing and to, say, to do so and gain uh, um, access to markets and supply chains with that commodity palm oil we know that a lot of original um, habitat and, and rainforest had to, had to be destroyed with the biodiversity along with it and the people living in these habitats as well. So this has been a controversial issue all along, um, to what degree uh, that is acceptable or not, or to what degree negotiations, trade negotiations like the one we're dealing with right now in Switzerland, are a suitable tool to address these uh, issues of environmental and human rights uh, violations, for example, that come along with these production forms. So um, that's roughly the setting. Another setting that is more of a Swiss uh, significance is that along these questions of corporate responsibility of human rights and for environmental um, violations, law violations, Switzerland just has passed a um, what we call an initiative that was launched from the population, the Swiss population and brought to election just recently in, in on the last, I think last uh, weekend of November. And it was uh, uh, to introduce a law at the constitutional level of Swiss uh, law about responsibility and responsible business behavior following the laws and rules as they apply in Switzerland, also elsewhere in the world. This has been a remarkable uh, process and um, initiative as it has had several record-breaking traits. For example, it was broadly supported by a number, I think the number was something around 130 Swiss-based organizations, church-based environmental rights-based organizations who were behind it. The fundraising was enormous. The debate, the public debate was as well enormous and very broad. And in the end, it turned out that it won the popular vote. So I'm happy to uh, report that the majority of the Swiss people have voted for it, even though that majority was slim. It was 50.7%. 
but still that was a remarkable win. It did not go through because it did, they did not win the popular votes in a majority of the Swiss cantons, which is by law required for such an initiative to be accepted at the constitutional level. So in the end, it was kind of a win and a failure to win. And this is kind of the background in front of which we are going to discuss now, because we now are back to the point where we have to try to get corporate responsibility into trade agreements. And my question and our question to our experts tonight is, what do they think, how reliable or how likely is this um, that we can deal and configurate human rights violation, environmental law violations into such trade agreements, given also the fact that the majority of the Swiss people would support such trade agreements that have strong and effective rules in it that make sure that human rights and environmental rights are being obeyed. So that's the setting. I don't want to say more about this. I would move forward and explain the process to you. The process is as follows. We have two experts who will inform us in brief presentations of 10 to maximum 15 minutes uh, from different perspectives. I will introduce the speakers in a moment. You have uh, a chance for clarifying questions you have, simply clarifying questions to each of the presenters for a few minutes afterwards. But please reserve overall questions of content um, for a later debate. We will have a plenary discussion then following both presentations. We have an hour and a half. That should be plenty of time to discuss with you whatever question or input you still have. You have various options of making your contributions. You have a chat function at the bottom of the Zoom and you have a Q&A section. Also, you find the symbol at the bottom of the Zoom for you. You can use, use either one for posting your questions and comments. I will read your comments and questions in particular later on and post them for you to the speakers and to the general, um, to the plenary. The rules are following. Um, the sessions and the presentations and the speakers are recorded. You see that little button of recording in the left upper corner of your screen. You will not your question, your name, you must write your name in the Q&A and the um, chat. We will not ask questions from people who want to stay anonymous but we will only use or use your initials and not read your full name for the questions unless you explicitly want us to do so. And that is not recorded. However, if you have also a chance to, as far as I know, I think we can make this happen. If you want to make a verbal statement, you can notify us that that is what you want. And I hope my technical backup here will be able to then unmute you and allow you to the video to come on, but that will then be recorded as well. So just that you know. All right, I was just told it works that you can make a verbal uh, uh, comment. So if you wish to do so, you can. You must just indicate that in the chat or in the Q&A, but again, you will then be going on record. All right, with that, I think, um, without further ado, I will move and introduce to you our first speaker of tonight. Um, it is Dr. Elizabeth Berge. She is, an, by training, an, uh, a lawyer. She is an attorney at law. She is uh, currently a senior lecturer of law and sustainability at the Center for Development and, and Environment at the uh, CDE called uh, CDE in abbreviation at the University of Bern. And I uh, had the pleasure of serving with her together with her uh, on the board of directors of a, a large uh, Swiss-based uh, development organization called Bread for All. So we go back many years now. So Elisabeth, for that, I, if I missed something, you're free to introduce yourself to it, but the virtual floor is yours right now. 
you must share your presentation on your own with us and you must unmute yourself or you must be unmuted by our staff. Is it better to share the PDF or the PowerPoint PDF? I try with that. Okay. You can share, I guess, whatever you wish on the screen, yes. Do you see, um, do you see it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, just a full screen mode. Um, okay, you see and hear me then. Okay, good I afternoon. I can hear you. I hope everybody else does as well. Mm -hmm. And if not, I hope they would, they would let us know. There is right now, just to inform you, we have a total of 45 participants right now. Okay. That's great. Uh, it's um, hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, good evening. <laughs> here, at least in Switzerland, it's evening. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here and to be on this panel. It's a bit uh, a shame that I can't know who you are, but I. Hopefully, I will learn uh, later in this evening. Uh, my light is not very bright, but still, I hope you see something. So the, um, the presentation is more important than my picture. Um, thank you, Angelica, for presenting me. Just a few additional words on uh, uh, words on what I'm exactly doing. So I'm based at the University of Bern as a legal scientist, but I usually work with other uh, scientists from other disciplines on um, sustainable development related questions, north-south questions, etc. My uh, uh, speciality is um, policy coherence for sustainable development, economic policies, how they relate to sustainable development, etc. I've worked for years now on trade issues and I, I try uh, to look at what happens in the trade field, how it's um, framed and newly framed, etc. What should, how trade arrangements should be framed from a sustainable development perspective but i try to get with my colleagues to look also at the impact of trade arrangements we have uh, in place and uh, regarding this agreement uh, switzerland together with the efta countries which include um, iceland uh, norway and Liechtenstein. So this is the group of the EFTA countries. They have, have already negotiated the uh, an agreement, a new trade agreement with Indonesia. It's called SIPA. So this means Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. This agreement has already been concluded. And what is uh, interesting for us, at least in Switzerland, that there will be a referendum uh, on this agreement next spring. So this will be the first referendum since, I believe, 72 in Switzerland on a trade agreement. And this is why uh, there is more public scrutiny than usually, uh, than it's usually the case with trade agreements. What is especially um, um, discussed uh, with regard to this agreement are the palm oil provisions, uh, which are included in the agreement. Since um, these provisions are quite, um, they apply a new approach. Yes, and since they apply this new approach, which I have, for example, as a legal scientist advocated for for many years, I was asked um, a year ago, more or less, to um, do a study on this agreement to, to check how it's included, etc. And this study is here, uh, but it's in German. So for those who understand German, German could be interesting to uh, read that the, the study includes all the details of the agreement as regards palm oil and the sustainability chapter included in the agreement. I, I have just uh, published another article in English on um, where, uh, together with a colleague, we compared the Indonesian agreement to the Mercosur agreement, which is currently uh, not yet entirely concluded, but as uh, Switzerland and EFTA countries have negotiated with Mercosur countries. What uh, is important uh, to mention when you look at an agreement from a sustainability perspective, uh, here, for example, in an Indonesian agreement, of course, it's important to look at the palm oil provisions or the sustainability chapters. Uh, there are many other sustainability relevant provisions in the agreement, like intellectual property provisions, uh, provisions uh, as regards access of financial services to the market, etc. I did not look at these, um, at these provisions since this was not the mandate. So if you ask yourself whether the agreement is sustainable, you should look at all the other provisions too, not only at the palm oil provisions. But today the palm oil is kind of what, uh, what is mostly discussed and I'd like to present what is in the agreement, how we, as a, how I assess these provisions, whether it's a good or bad idea, etc. And um, I'd like to say a word on uh, what is needed in order to make 
the basically good idea, what I find a good idea in the agreement to make it a, a good um, uh, in implementation, that it's effective in implementation, whether this is possible or not. Um, uh, I presented uh, this already also to the parliaments, etc. So it's, it's a bit a similar presentation and I, I start um, by framing it legally and, and then it gets more and more practical. So uh, in Switzerland, we asked ourselves whether this agreement is in compliance with the Swiss constitution. And what is uh, quite interesting uh, for Swiss people and the Swiss public is that we have this new provision in the Swiss constitution is article 104 AD, uh, saying that the Swiss government should provide for cross-border trade relations that contribute to the sustainable development of the agriculture and food sector. So basically, this is an obligation for the Swiss government to negotiate trade arrangements which promote food sustainability, both at home and abroad. And here now the question is, is that the case with palm oil as regards palm oil production in Indonesia? I mentioned here a research project where, um, uh, which I lead as SNF funded research project, which uh, deals with this question, what that exactly means and could mean, if you're interested. So some data on palm oil, it's a bit, um, the first data a bit old, but, uh, at, but uh, still more or less um, correct. So Switzerland imports uh, about, I'm not pretty sure whether this is still entirely correct, but it doesn't matter so much. Uh, it imports about 30,000 to 40,000 tons of palm oil. And most of this uh, palm oil comes from Malaysia, not from Indonesia. And just a little, uh, a little amount of palm oil comes from Indonesia. And now, of course, in the, in the, in the trade negotiations, Indonesia, Indonesia was interested in getting uh, more out of this cake. So uh, EFTA countries uh, and partner countries, they negotiated some tariff quota. They uh, include a variety of concessions, so lower tariffs, but to a limited extent within a certain quota. And you find this all in my study, uh, so for which kind of palm oil, how much, etc. And um, for example, for raw palm oil, which is done for the palm oil, uh, you have a quota of 1,000 to 1,250 tons and tariff reduction within this quota is 30 to 35 percent. And so this means the tariffs go down for this amount of palm oil for, from Indonesia. And um, yes, uh, with the idea that then it gets uh, easier for Indonesian producers to export to Switzerland and EFTA countries. Some economists, they even argue that this price differential, which you, which you, um, uh, which you reach through the tariff reduction is not enough to promote uh, sustainable value chains and to promote uh, even that this will not result in more imports of palm oil from Indonesia. But this is not clear that it is quite contentious at this, at this stage. So, uh, what does the, um, there is a discussion in Switzerland what this, also whether this tariff rate quota would impact on the rape oil production in Switzerland, uh, since we also produce uh, oil in Switzerland. The Federal Council uh, is op of the op opinion that there might not be major impacts, and uh, the Federal Council, uh, the government of Switzerland, assumes that that would rather be trade diversion away from Malaysia. So that Malaysia would lose part of the cake and, and, and Indonesia would step in. But this is unclear. And uh, at the moment, it's also unclear whether there will be an ex post evaluation. If I was a politician, I would ask for an ex post evaluation once this uh, agreement is implemented in order to understand better what uh, happens and has happened. So, um, no. But um, what is more discussed is not whether, not only discussed whether uh, an increase in palm oil imports from Indonesia will impact on the rape oil sector in Switzerland, but also whether um, this increased import, what, would, what kind of dynamic would this um, support in Indonesia? 
Um, and what is interesting in this uh, agreement is that uh, for the first time, for the first time, Switzerland um, directly links imports to production standards. So um, it does not only include the sustainability chapter, which is a bit far from the con trade con concessions which are given, but for the first time, uh, the EFTA countries say, okay, you get tariff preferences, but under certain conditions. And these conditions are these conditions which are put in here uh, under Article 810 of the agreement. It's a very small footnote because usually you, uh, the countries didn't like uh, such kind of constructions, but they did so. And you find these footnotes in, a, um, in one of the chapters, and it says that you can only benefit from this tariff rate quota if uh, these conditions here under 810 are complied with. I will come to these conditions afterwards, but you can briefly uh, read that for yourself. So what does it say? It, it says that um, this palm oil, which will be imported into Switzerland and EFTA countries, will uh, need to be produced in a way that the laws would be applied, which protect primary forests, peatlands, ecosystems, which hold deforestation, etc. So which comply with the environmental laws which are in place. And at the same time, then palm oil needs to be uh, produced in a way which respects rights of local indigenous communities and workers. So, and if it, this is not the case, then this palm oil cannot be imported under these preferential conditions into Switzerland. It can be imported, but not under these preferential conditions. So these conditions are quite comprehensive and uh, include uh, the most important aspect of sustainability. Uh, in, in the trade jargon, if you have worked in trade for years, uh, you know this is a PPM. Um, a PPM, as we call that in the trade jargon, a PPM, uh, a PPM is um, a state applied to PPM if it treats a product differently depending on the way of production. So the production behind uh, this, um, if a state differentiate between a product, uh, between a product which has been produced this way and the other way around, this is, uh, would be in tension with the like product concept. So if you know a bit about trade law, usually you should treat products alike if they're similar or like. And, but environmental lawyers for years, they have asked states to implement PPMs and states were reluctant to implement those. And this is here the first time Switzerland did so. They really said, okay, we can do this differentiation and we can look at the production process behind. So this approach from a sustainability law perspective is really very innovative and interesting. The approach as a PPMs, you find them increasingly applied in timber, fish, biofuels, in the climate and trade debate they promoted, etc. Sustainability science, they usually argue we should go in this direction and, and make sure that the state also differentiates, not only private sector, but the state also differentiates between what is more and less sustainable. So, um, and then you, of course, in the bilateral agreements, uh, this is kind of a certain field of experimentation where you can uh, try out these new approaches. Then there is another interesting chapter in the agreement, is the cooperation chapter, saying that, okay, we have these tariff preferences, uh, these, these preferences in place, but they should be combined uh, with development cooperation and knowledge transfer, etc. But the extent needs to be defined. So this idea from a theoretical point of view is quite interesting. At least uh, if you have worked in trade law for years, then you're really surprised and, and you think, okay, th this is now really an interesting approach which should be followed and uh, closely looked at. But of course, the value of the approach as always, this stands and falls with the way of its implementation. So uh, how will that approach be implemented? In the SIPA, in the agreement as such, there is not much about implementation. It's, for example, written that 
um, the palm oil needs to be transported separately from the other which is not produced sustainably. And further elements need to be defined. There was a, uh, an idea uh, to, to more closely define how it needs to be implemented in the, um, in the, in the Bundesbeschluss, which is um, agreed by, by the parliament, but this was rejected. And at the moment, the government is uh, formulating an ordinance uh, more concretely defining how this rule should be implemented. This ordinance has not yet been issued, so we cannot discuss this ordinance at this stage. And the question would be whether this ordinance is uh, published before the referendum takes place. So the, uh, the discussion can be more concrete and be based on what are the ideas of how to implement this provision. So uh, which aspects need to be considered uh, when you think of a good implementation, implementation of these criteria? Ideally, you have um, somewhere out there ecologically and socially sound production systems which already exists and they're credibly certified and importers can just rely on that. For example, if you think of the organic library in Europe, this is more or less the case. But with Indonesian palm oil, it's much more complex as many um, scientists being familiar with Indonesia have told me. There are these existing standards like the RSPO, the ISPO, but they uh, have uh, certain issues. So on paper, the RSBO standard, which is the most, uh, um, most prominent standard, is the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil Standard. And the ISBO is kind of the Indonesian version of the standard. They're quite uh, nice. They are they comprehensive. They include most of uh, important social ecological dimensions, etc. There are some uh, minor gaps, but they not for, not um, so significant. But in reality, uh, as lots of scientific literature suggests, there are many, many deficits in implementation. There have been lots of displacements of, of indigenous people, small scale farmers, deforestation, soil erosion in the fields, also in fields where uh, palm oil has been certified. So, um, and what is also has, uh, research has shown that the auditing of the RSPO is, uh, is not entirely independent or as independent as it should be. What are the drivers behind that uh, situation is economic reality, price pressures, hungry meals, etc., governmental issues in Indonesia. So um, if the government likes to do something good out of that and really implement that uh, nice idea in a good way, what could and should it do? So uh, there are two areas of action you can think of. First, um, there is some need of improvement as regards the RSPO standard. It needs to be improved and complemented and uh, the auditing system is removed, etc. If the Swiss government works in this direction together with other stakeholders, this might have a broader impact and not only on Indonesia, but also on other uh, palm oil um, production uh, places. But what is uh, even more important, also if you if you imagine that you go to Indonesia and you, you come to a conclusion, okay, sustainable palm oil production, really sustainable palm oil production as laid down in this article of the 10 of the SIPA is not existing yet. So what should that, should you do then? Uh, scientists tell you that some upgrading is needed. You need, up, need to upgrade existing value chains and it's often best to apply a landscape approach. So for example, you go uh, to Indonesia and say, okay, here in this region, here we promote upgrading processes and make sure that small scale farmers are not left out, etc. We really um, support a process which is inclusive and uh, ecologically sound. This can be done through cooperation and, um, and some resources, of course, are needed. Um, how could that be done? So Switzerland can, together with the EFTA countries, Norway is also in the board and is a very rich country. They should first of all improve the knowledge base. They should know more about Indonesia. Indonesia is not a homogeneous country. 
Indonesia has lots of governmental issues. They need to build a board of experts, anthropologists, others who know a lot about Indonesia. They need to develop a vision of sustainable palm oil production, an idea of where and how to intensify support and analysis of weaknesses of standards. And of course, this is a partnership approach. Indonesia has to say yes to what Switzerland and EFTA countries suggest. They need to uh, closely negotiate with Indonesia on the implementation process. Uh, and they need to negotiate effective implementation and, and, and uh, also with the stakeholders uh, in the area they'd like to work together with Indonesia on more sustainable palm oil production. So kind of it's an umsetzungsprozess and takes some time and resources. Um, as I, this process needs to be accompanied, according to my understanding, by a round table of, of experts who have an idea about uh, the situation and um, from academia, but also civil society uh, and economy and, and the companies who are involved with. Um, then, of course, you need stakeholder processes in the Indonesia, in the specific regions where you do this upgrading and targeted studies, etc. So some, it's quite of uh, work intensive and some work needs to be done in order to get where you'd like, you'd like to be. You cannot just say, OK, we take the standard, it's much more uh, work is needed. So um, if this would be done in this way, um, uh, this could be quite an interesting, uh, interesting process. Uh, what is the role of the politics? So it's not yet clear, for example, uh, what's the role of the parliament, whether they have to report back every year on the, how it's implemented, whether there will be ex post evaluation, whether there will be a, a room for public scrutiny. The process is not yet clear at all. Um, but uh, it very much depends on this Verordnung, what is in this Verordnung, and it should be published, I believe, very soon, but I, I'm not informed about the time frame. Yeah, so I, I would just recommend uh, not to uh, just say, okay, this is a bad agreement or a very good agreement, but to look close at this is a really interesting approach, at least uh, from a theoretical perspective, which has been chosen there, but to look closer, more closer at these ordinance and to also come into the process and ask for, uh, for being able to accompany the process and, and uh, by um, pushing for some inclusive uh, elements in the process. So this is uh, from my side. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, that was already uh, quite tough uh, food for thought here right now. Um, I give you the chance of uh, asking clarifications questions. <clears throat> I have one question in the Q and A. Um, I'm not saying the name, but the name is there. JG Yu is asking, Given that Indonesia is a heterogeneous country, and given that this is the case for most oil palm producer countries, then is it really useful to have a vision of sustainable palm oil? Shouldn't we have various visions according to the diverse realities? Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. Um... Is this a clarification question, or can we keep this for the broader discussion? I'm not sure about this one. <laughs> Of course, this is what I put here is a bit simplified. Eh? Of course, if you have a, a real uh, discussion on, on the situation in Indonesia, then you might come to the conclusion uh, that you have different regions with different, um, um, who look very differently and the issues are different, etc. cetera. And, and um, yeah, but this needs to develop, be developed together with people, uh, with experts who, who know the context very well. Mm -hmm. Okay, but uh, I think we may come back to the broader issue of heterogeneous um, environments versus uh, uniform kind of rules. Mm -hmm. um, there is another question in the Q&A by NR. Um, it's asking, is the PPM just for Switzerland or for all EFTA? Mm -hmm. It's for all EFTA countries, yes. Okay. Well, as I understand, it's mostly discussed now in Switzerland since we have this referendum. Yeah, 
Okay. I'm not sure whether, whether people in, in Iceland or Norway know about these people. Yeah. Okay. Mm. All right. Um, this seems to be, for now, the questions of clarification. So um, given the fact that you have taken a little longer than 10 or 15 minutes, I will now swiftly move to uh, Dennis Risha. Dennis, I'm not sure, Risha, if I'm pronouncing your, your name correctly, please um, forgive me if I don't. <laughs> um, Dennis is a political ecologist by first training. He uh, was, as I was told, an agronomist for many, many years. He worked uh, as such uh, at the international level. Then he added, uh, did a little bit of a career change, added a PhD in sociology to it is today mainly busy with analyzing and looking into food supply chains. He is uh, serving as the vice president of a Swiss Aid Geneva office, and he is also on the board of directors of Swiss Aid. Um, with that, uh, Dennis, if I've missed something, or like, like Lisa, you are welcome to uh, explain your background in more detail. But the virtual floor is yours from now. You have to do now what you practiced earlier. <laughs> do the sharing, screen share, and choose your presentation. Very good. If you unmute yourself or being unmuted. Okay. Now we go. Very good. <laughs> Off you go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Much Angelica. Uh, if, so much Elizabeth. Uh, yes. Uh, Dennis, may may I uh, briefly interrupt you? Uh, your your connection, your internet connection is very unstable. I would suggest we do it that you shut off, turn off your video. Usually that helps because we have your screen. I hope the screen does still stay if you turn off your video. Okay. And we hear you and you ex uh, lead us through your presentation uh, just without your image. And then you come on later. Do we hear you? Yes. Do you see? Very good. Good. Yes. Let's try this. I hope it's more stable then. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. Um, just to explain a little bit uh, about me, just to explain why I'm so happy about this conversation is that uh, countries, uh, Indonesia, Guatemala, uh, West and East Africa, at different levels in the United Nations environment program where set up the environmental governance. But uh, then after all, so in the field with different NGOs, I was in fact linked to Indonesia, where I was working for a, a local uh, the NGO called Panico, and we really try to stop the deforestation through palm oil. And that's why, uh, through all this career, uh, first as agronomist, I uh, discovering um, environmental uh, policies or international policies, but how they are really implemented. And that's why I did this uh, other career. It, at the same time as working, just to really understand what is the logic behind all uh, these agreements and why we really fail to uh, have impact on the ground because we really fail after 25 years of career. I can tell you the biodiversity loss is still the same. It remains at 1% a year in developing in, uh, in the tropical countries. But then despite all this political or social or, or technocratic arrangement, uh, we cannot say that we have achieved a lot. And therefore that's why I work for the last 10 years trying to understand the the, the gaps and it comes then uh, to the next slide uh, where I have different um, articles that uh, I can provide later uh, this last 10 years exactly about the topic we're talking about and there do a presentation in four parts the first is why we have this issue about trade is really we need to understand all together this global global uh, supply chain. Second thing, 
is about the producer. You know, we talk about producer as a large uh, group, but in fact, we need to exactly understand who they are. And the third is about sustainability. What do we mean by that? And the fourth will then conclude why we talk about things, but in fact, in practice, we mean other things. And the first thing is then, what is this global supply chain in Palm Oil? And um, we need to understand that it has developed very fast this last 20 years, but not before. And it's really a request from the demand side for the agricultural, industrial food and cleansing agent and the agrofuel. And you can see that in Europe, um, it's, it's, it's raised, you can see a little bit, but in fact, European countries, even Swiss countries, don't really like palm oil anymore. They, they would like to have a bit of less of it, especially in the food sector, but it's still raised because of biofuel. Then uh, there is still uh, raising demands here in the Western countries, but it's especially due to uh, biofuel. And here we are the different products with palm oil. And why the agro industry really likes palm oil these last 25 years, when in fact it was not a main crop before. He liked it for different reasons, long conversation, conservation, but the main thing is because it's cheap. Then when you understand that the reason is cheap, you really understand later the logic that that's at stake. And the proof of it, of what I say about the historical strength is that you can see that we really have uh, raising demands, you know, in the, even 95 or 99, it was not so, uh, so, so, so big. It was not much more than 20 million tons a year. And now in 2019, we have uh, uh, 75 million tons a year. Who are the main countries? Here they are. And in fact, you have to understand that is you know 50 more than 50 percent of this world trade is indonesia in that means uh, hectares of lands and indonesia is about 11 millions of hectares when the supply means demand is where you go this world trade and this world trade is not as free as it looks this world trade is made of oligopoly on the, the chain. The oligopoly comes from the upstream three firms, um, growers, traders, processors, um, um, that the one who are providing because in fact, Indonesia and Malaysia have consolidated their industry uh, through developing very large palm oil producers between 100,000 until 1 million, 1 million hectares. And the biggest being Sam Darby with about 1 million hectares. On the other side, which is the don't drink firms, it's still control, especially with the ex-colonial countries or at least with, uh, with uh, industries linked to that them, which means Dutch based or British based. And therefore you have very, very, uh, very uh, the, uh, um, firms that are really, really inside that trade. Uh, for example, on the banks, you have a uh, Rabobank or HBSC uh, for the retailers of, of course Unilever. But uh, you have that, um, you have um, that for, uh, for the others. Yeah, then that's the trade that it is. It's basically, it frames you the issue. But in reality, if you come now from the Indonesian side at the producing level, I said that we're big players, but these are the big players in the international level. Now, when we talk about the players, are the to be more careful. There are two big differences. One is the large scale producers. Large scale producers are in fact um, uh, organized around uh, large large estates. 
An estate is about 4,000 uh, hectares. It's mm, with a mill. The mill is very important because when you have collected the fruits, you really need to process it very well and very fast in within one day if you don't do it you lose the quality of oil and after it's exported these 4000 uh, hectares of estates are then joined together and they created this palm oil producers therefore the big palm oil producers are in fact a networks of the different estates but at the same time we have small orders and small orders are really important Indonesia, they are about half of the uh, hectares, and most of the of the farmers, in fact, because you, you need a bit more small orders per hectare than uh, uh, farmers for the large scale growers. And these uh, small orders, they typically only uh, manage two, three hectares, and they are in different schemes. Either they are independent or independent or independent, but anyway, in both, in both systems, we need to understand that the small orders produce another oil. They produce normally this red oil. This is the original oil made of palm oil. This original oil is in fact a red oil that is uh, full of uh, vitamin A and uh, vitamin uh, A. E. And uh, but the structural problems of these small orders is that they don't control the meal. As I explained before, the meal is critical to have uh, an oil or an oil that you can then get neutral and then you can export further. Therefore, these actors are eliminated from the international trade. Or if they are within the national, international trade, it means they need to sell their products to the, the, to the mill that is controlled by large-scale growers. And therefore, in that system, they are depending on the large-scale growers where they only can sell their fruits at very low price to these large actors. Third issue now is what do we mean by sustainable palm oil and their structural shortcomings? And therefore we need to get back to know what do we mean in fact by sustainability, sustainable development. Sustainability and sustainable development comes as a word in 87 by Brentland, which is this idea of a development that is respectful of our common future. It's a development that is, in fact, respectful from the other humankind and our environment. It's only what it means. In 87, there is not this idea of economic development because when you set up the idea of sustainable or sustainable development, you have this idea that economy is within the society. Economy is not a separated issue. And that comes the, the, the talk. When you take the original meaning of sustainable development, you are in fact thinking about social adaptation. You are talking about maintaining social diversity, maintaining cultural diversity, and meeting, maintaining at the same time biodiversity. And why? Because there is a clear and direct link with biodiversity and cultural diversity. And here is an example I could have found in Indonesia is the same. Indonesia is an extremely diverse a country about ethnicity, about the cultural diversity, about the biodiversity. And it's the same thing you, you can see in, in uh, other tropical countries. The more countries are socially diverse, the more they are biodiversity diverse, the more they are culturally diverse. This is just the uh, a, a structural issue. But 
what happens in the 90s until now, it has been sold another meat of sustainable development, where sustainable development is now digested. In the 90s, it has been recreated by creating a meat of three pillar, three pillar interdependent, but three pillar different, and three pillar equal, environment, social, and economic. And um, when we talk now about sustainable development or sustainable palm oil, when I study specifically the RSPO, but it's the same about SPO, and I take you here the what means RSPO, what means sustainable palm oil for the RSPO is, is here. And you can see then you have this three pillar, uh, they have rebaptized, uh, they, they changed the name to be uh, nicer, this three, two years ago, but in reality, it was just economic, environment, and social, but now it's proper prosperity, people, and planet. And then you have these three pillar, and these three pillar, with these three pillars, you have principles for each of the pillar, and then you have, uh, you have indicators, and then you have uh, accounting numbers, and who basically, uh, uh, sustainability now is developed in all these standards as is also understood at international level. The consequences of this is that sustainability is understood as a managerial approach to a continuous improvement and uniformization. But that meaning itself is favoring the large-scale business model on the supply chain because is in fact the way they are improving their own practices all through the history without waiting in fact the meaning of sustainability but it also has an impact on our, our own vision on our own understanding of what is sustainability and that's even the most dangerous history when you study rspo when you study the sustainable palm oil that has been established 2004 till now, we have different failures. The first one is, of course, a market failure. The world is asking maybe for 15% of sustainable palm oil because it's the Western countries ask for it, but not the overall world. Then basically, the RSPO is not adapted or is not requested for the whole world. The second is an economic failure. In reality, the price to, to, uh, to, be, um, uh, to be certified is too costly for the small actors and therefore small producers, small scale actors don't, uh, don't get uh, certified and only large scale uh, actors of 100,000 hectare to 1 million get, uh, get uh, certified to gain uh, European access. Then the third thing is the self-regulation. Only NGO can fo focus on emblematic cases. And as uh, uh, Elizabeth explained very well, uh, the, uh, the, the check and balance is not really working very well. Um, um, the third and the fourth one is that, that uh, this overall uh, system is not embedded in local and national policies and therefore uh, indeed uh, large actors make some improvement but small actors are not interested by the sustainable palm oil and therefore they are below the radar. And as I said before, the managerial discourse is maybe the main thing. The issue related to that, to develop and have invented the sustainable time world for the la between 2004-2020 has the consequences as such. First, only about 80 large-scale producers are certifying around 8 million hectares and they're certifying as sustainable, but in fact to reach the Western market, being the European and the American one. And secondly, within the country, at local level, nothing has changed much. And the Palmer, uh, the Palmer expansion 
and uh, uh, local destruction still remains. Then the real issue we can see is that how is it possible that we have this voluntary stress standard that is e existing and developing and even people thinking that is a very good idea when it doesn't, it doesn't reach its goal. And we need to understand in fact that as a territorial process where different actors on the supply chain and that's why it, i said to you so important to understand the one who are winning and losing on the supply chain at the that was the first step the one who are winning and losing on supply chain created in fact a territory through the meaning of sustainability and uh, this has interest for them because it controls their reputational risk at lowest cost. And they find also a mechanism to counter attack critiques. And therefore, it's quite obvious that uh, the most exposed agro business firms based in Europe, like Unilever, Nestle, and others, they are very happy about the sustainability standards and they really want to embrace it because they have a mechanism to get away from critics and not to change their system and to have that at quite low cost. But what, how do they achieve this territorialization? This territorialization is in fact achieved two, through two mechanisms. The, problem, the first one is strategic. The strategy means that these actors on the supply chain that are, 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 are dominant created the rules that are the best for them within thinking about the other actors, especially the local small orders. And the second is about a cognitive system where they impose us the meaning of sustainability, which is in fact structurally difficult. The result of that is this transnational territory made of frontier, historical connection, internal co coherence with managerial practices and discourse, with prime beneficiaries and marginalized people. And it's where that, well, I want to, don't want to lose too much time, but I've explained who are the winner, but you need to understand as a conclusion, who are the loser. The loser in all of these are in fact the local people. They are marginalized, and why? Because their own vision or what could be sustainability is totally vanished, is totally discarded. And therefore, local people, when they have this idea from the perspective that sustainability means respect of other humankind, equal access to, um, to uh, their livelihood, equal access to the economy on the supply chain, uh, there's also respect for the environment, respect for the, the forest. In fact, all of this is, is, is totally taken away from the discourse and in fact is, is, is uh, put completely aside. And that's exactly the, the structural issue, is that the core issue about what is even sustainable development and therefore what the role of the small owners, what is the role of these marginalized people in all the supply chain is uh, totally uh, eliminated from the whole discourse and practices. Yeah, yeah. I will not to, therefore, I, just to finish on the conclusion, as I said, sustainable trade agreements are not neutral and they give a false understanding of what is sustainability. They marginalize fundamental actors, which as explained, on one hand are the local producers, but on the other hand are also the, uh, the consumers in developed countries. And, uh, and worse than that, people don't really realize, but they also have impact 
or local uh, development in uh, southern countries, even destabilizing local uh, local politics and local models of territorial development. Therefore, as you can see, I'm a bit uh, critical on all these trade agreements and how they are uh, developed and set up. Thank you very much, Dennis. Uh, another <laughs> very dense and very informative uh, presentation. Thank you both. Um, with this, if you stop sharing now, Dennis, um, then we are back into the mode where we see uh, the other participants better, I hope. And with this, we would also enter into our discussion and Q and A. Uh, I have so far, so please, uh, this is now over to the participants and the attendees of, of, this, of this meeting. You have, we have roughly another 25 minutes for discussing whatever issue burns, burns on your lips and in your minds and what you have to contribute to the presentations here. Please either write in the chat or write in the Q&A or make yourself um, known so we can allow you to talk uh, live if you wish to do so. I have one question that I overlooked already um, last in the last round, but I'm, I'm inclined to keep that question actually to the end. Um, because it's more a general, a fundamental question. And that is something that I would like to pose to you at the end uh, of this presentation, uh, of this, this whole uh, webinar. I have been, I'm getting a comment that people uh, like your presentations a lot and they are asking that you share your slides with them. Would you be willing to do that? Dennis and Elizabeth nodding your head or unmuting yourself. So I see, I see Elizabeth nodding. I'm not sure what I'm reading into Dennis' reaction. <laughs> yeah, we cannot hear you. You're muted. Now you can let you know. Is that okay to share your slides? Sure, but in that case, it may be interesting to share. Yeah, the, with all the uh, whole package, you know, uh, yeah. with the critical uh, scientific, because you know, not or simply the one where you know to make something interesting. Exactly. For Actually, uh, this this as I said initially, this session is recorded, and we intend to put this on our website, so you will be informed. Um, this is not going to happen now, but we will probably next week or I don't know, technically it takes a couple days, but you will get with the presentation then also the, uh, the speakers to, to present. Yeah, they're going to be uploaded. You find it in the chat if you look there. So um, with that, if there is, I don't see my overlooking something, people, you have to help me then otherwise. Okay, here it is. Um, a person MP is asking Dennis, um, what would be, be the better alternative to this kind of trade agreement in terms of sustainability? What would you suggest instead if trade agreements aren't doing the job? What would do? Oh. That's a big one. Yes. Do you, you want to have that? No, not so much. Not so much. Not so much. In fact, you know, there, there's, I think people don't really uh, realize that agriculture is not a commodity as any other commodity. That's the, uh, that's the fundamental problem. And therefore, you know, trade agreements are important. They, they, they bring a, a, a trade, they bring peace also, they bring understanding. You know, this is, uh, the trade is not an issue at all. The, the issue is really more about the commodity we are talking about because if you develop palm oil on large scale, for example, in Indonesia, what people don't understand is that this piece of land is taken away from local people. And this piece of land, basically, they could have uh, developed agriculture in other way. And therefore, the problem of, of in a different countries is that we really need to all together redesign our food sovereignty. 
it's not possible that uh, we develop palm oil at large, large scale and it goes for, for biofuel and for the car industry in Europe. It, it's as simple, you know, in 50 years, people will say that was just insane. It's not possible. People are starving. You know, at local people, they are just, you know, Indonesian people are really poor, you know. And when you have this palm oil development, uh, you, people, you, you say, oh, it's a good idea. It's not really a good idea. Why? Because at local level, the, the local farmers is totally unskilled development. It's just about palm oil. It's just not uh, something that is very skillful will develop any skills. You know, you have to understand the situation where he is. And after he cannot even eat this palm oil, he needs, he, he needs to sell it to a trader that he doesn't even get the most of it. Then, then basically the problem is really our understanding of the trade and our understanding of what is uh, food sovereignty and how we can develop uh, food sovereignty in a more uh, decentralized manner uh, where everybody and different regions can really benefit from it. Right, right. I, I, t I personally totally agree with that. And while I don't see many other questions here, I, I take the chance to add my own um, um, take of this. What I also th already thought when Lisa was uh, uh, giving her presentation and giving those the rules, you know, like these PPM rules, process and production methods and saying um, you link your, your production to standards on how you should do this. It is kind of, uh, it struck me like uh, uh, completely illogic in itself. You are demanding, because that's what we're about, we are demanding a standardized uniform commodity for industrial purposes primarily to be produced in the primary forest or where? I mean, how do you want to protect primary forest? Because you cannot produce that standardized commodity in a primary forest it's automatically you have to chop trees down if you want to produce the standardized commodity so what is it's completely illogic in itself that this is not possible if that's what you want to be doing so an economic frame thinking you can solve environmental and ecological and social and cultural issues by just writing something in the law although these things are mutually exclusive if you want a commodity, you must chop down trees. And if you want a commodity to a good price, you automatically stimulate the demand, which means you will chop down more trees. So this is kind of completely uh, incoherent in itself and shows that economists and lawyers are thinking about something that's not in the process of ecology. But Elizabeth can answer to that. And now are coming some more questions, but Elizabeth, you can say. Yes, thanks, Angelica. Uh, this is very provocative, but this is not yes. so. If it's this, this the case that it's not sustainable and so it should not get tariff preferences, you know, this is not what is saying in the trade agreement. It's just uh, how I argue. Um, there was a study as a city was um, doing a study uh, to get for in on behalf of Coop um, on integrated palm oil production in African countries. There are other ways of palm oil production which are more integrated. They might not happen in, in, in Indonesia so far as I understood. Mm -hmm. um, but there are other ways of if, if I, for example, would have written the agreement, I would not have talked about palm oil, but, but a basket of products from high value regions where you include small scale farmers and they get, get better access to foreign markets if they'd like to have so. <laughs> so you now understand that trade is not that the question is not whether, uh, so for, years, for years poor countries were asking to have access for agriculture products on our markets. And for years at the WTO, this was the question. We need a better access to European markets for our agriculture products. Both small scale and large scale farmers were asking that. But now the question is, for whom do you give the access, access for what kind of product from which, uh, from which kind of systems? And if palm oil can be, could be produced in a more sustainable, integrated way in certain landscapes where you have other products you would also buy if the people would like to sell, etc. As you showed that the small scale farmers also producing palm oil. Of course, at the moment, we are not there at all. The mills are, I know this mill problem, the hungry mills, we have studies on the hungry mills in Indonesia, etc. But you could understand this agreement as a wake up call and say, okay, but now let's do something good out of that. Yeah. Include a small scale farmers, etc. 
natural. So this is what I what I'd like to argue. If you did it the way you did, um, Angelica, you suppose, then it would not be sustainable as as it's put down. Exactly. Yes, uh -huh. and you must understand that from the production side, if you have a bunch of small scale farmers um, producing their their palm oil and you want that, you do not get <laughs> standardized quality. <laughs> And that's a problem for the, the market, the big ones who need uniform standardized qualities. That, that's, that's, that's the incoherence there. It's wonderful, you can produce, of course, palm oil differently. But it struck me when Dennis was showing those pictures that smallholders are producing something completely different. And my question to you was actually then, what happens with that smallholder palm oil that seems to be a totally different oil quality than what they're getting from those plantations, that wasn't clear to me. And then I have questions and we'll uh, raise them to you. Raises. Okay. Can you answer what happens with the smallholder palm oils? Is that going into the same supply chains as, even though it's a red oil and it's a different oil? <laughs> Elizabeth is struggling yeah. with some background. <laughs> the, 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 as usual, it's always the, the, the setup, and, and for smallholders, everything is different. Um, there is, uh, when you are talking about West Africa, it's very clear, it's really uh, embedded in their own uh, livelihood system, and therefore, it's just about red uh, palm oil they just use for uh, at local level, and therefore, they even imported palm oil from Indonesia. It's a bit uh, funny. But uh, when he's talking about Indonesia or Malaysia, these are uh, a bit different because uh, they, they try to survive and to have better incomes, and therefore, they also tend to develop their small scale palm oil plantation. And when they have fruits, then they will sell it, the palm oil, the, the, the mill that is controlled by the large scale actors. And that's what happens. And there are two systems. One, they are really independent and they do that by themselves and they try to get. Um, uh, the price uh, for the, the 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 fruits they 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 they, they, they give or not they don't give they sell to the to the mill or they are within the scheme of the mill and in fact uh, the the large scale companies are set up different small orders and provide technical advice to these small orders and then they will uh, sell. Uh, or in fact, that case more provide the the, the fruits to the to this large these large firms that has uh, that has um, helped them to set up their own system. That's that's the two main system. But at the end of the day, they don't control, and that's exactly the problem. They don't control the mill. They don't control their uh, uh, supply chain, and that's they are both in this monopsy situation where they are totally dependent of the of the uh, uh, larger actors, and and not only they are dependent structurally from them, but as I said before, they don't develop skills because this is unfortunate. But this this the palm oil plantation is not a cultivation that requires a lot of technical skills and they cannot even then redevelop these skills for other uh, purpose later. Okay, I have now uh, more comments and questions coming in. So now it's, it's uh, we've stimulated the discussion. I have a comment, a comment, not a question from H. Um, uh, who commented and said, we cannot generalize that local communities suffer because of oil palm expansion. Also, the well-being level may vary. And he is citing uh, Santika et al. and two papers from Santika et al. My research results also reported that local communities in East Kalimantan wanted to grow oil palm. Any um, there are many reasons why local communities wanted to grow oil palm, for example, because of climate change. The dry season was longer than usual, um, make people switch to oil palm, or apparently they grow better as considered more re resilient than paddy rice, etc. So that is a comment. You can, you can uh, let me read, yeah, read, read. There's two questions for Elizabeth, so, and then you can uh, answer to that. 
Um, BS is asking, uh, Elizabeth, you seem to recommend setting up complex structures to develop sustainability rules, etc., and monitor the implementation. How much do you think the Indonesian government will be interested in this just for the Swiss market and at a time where they're going uh, with the omnibus law into a rather different direction? Mm -hmm. Elizabeth. Yeah, um, thank you for this question. No, I don't, um, uh, um, I don't propose to set up complex structures, but I propose to set up a, a good process and to invest resources into the establishment of sustainable value chains, including, um, so in order to give small scale palm oil farmers in Indonesia a chance to export to the Swiss market. And the entry point for Indonesia is the trade agreement. They did sign to the trade agreement. And if they get resources, if they get funding for that, from Norway and Switzerland. And this is the crucial question. Is there some money flowing there to really um, um, up value what uh, in certain regions, uh, certain kind of palm oil um, production? You can also think of a new mill, etc., where small scale farmers could bring their products. And this, uh, if they're interested, they could then export to Switzerland. You have a, a better standard, etc. But this is the question where the resources will be invested into such kind of process. And then Indonesia would pretty, could pretty well um, agree to, uh, to have such a project okay. and such a process going on. Good. I need to push a little bit because we're running yeah. out of time. And there is more yeah. questions in there. Yes, please keep it. Brief. Yeah, it's very important that I reply to this issue about uh, uh, price and the fact that small orders get uh, better. I think there's a huge misunderstanding here. What happens about palm oil is true that, and as I said, uh, 2.5 million of people are, are individual small orders in Indonesia. They do that because they want. They are not forced to do it. The issue is that why they do it. They do it very simply uh, because the, the, the person didn't really summarize it, but it's in fact very simply. Is the crop for which they have the, the, the best incomes compared to the work they need to do? Then basically you, you have the, the best, is uh, 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 the, 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 the best you can do. But at the same time, it still remains very low because it's, it's a tree basically that grow for 25 years. You need to work on it and you can have uh, some incomes quite, uh, quite sure because it's predictable the whole year. And therefore this crop is, give you uh, incomes more or less for 10 months out of 12, then you can have something. It's very important, that's why you develop. Where I criticize it is not there. What I criticize it is more fundamental, is the fact that these small owners that provide these foods, they hardly get money for what they do because they give only some fruits, they don't control the meal, they don't control the, the value, they, do, they don't control the expansion, they don't even uh, do the, 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 the first, uh, uh, the, the, the first uh, you know, creating the, the, the first oil. The, then basically, these people, if you see the whole structure of the value chain, they're totally screwed. You know, uh, technically, if you see the value chain, for the job they do, they have hardly anything, is the only thing I want to say. And the other thing is that because they sell, they do palm oil, their crops is only through expansion. If, and if the palm oil becomes very... Uh, oh, Dennis, you are muted. You muted yourself. Dennis, you must unmute yourself. You must have hit the mute button. It wasn't me. I wasn't stopping. No. Oh, uh, uh, go, then there is this problem that they don't get the correct price for what they do. And the second problem is that the, as they depend on a crop that they need to expand, the, it takes part of the territory. And if the price is changing, they are just, uh, you know, they can be very poor in two years. Then basically the situation is not very good from their perspective. Okay, okay. Good. I think that's understood. There is uh, two, two more issues I would like to pose, or it was Elizabeth was, was addressed. Um, it says, um, where is it? Uh, now it moved because the question was removed. 
Um, the question just disappeared. I just wanted to read it and it is gone. Okay, well, then uh, another comment. Palm oil is only a small thing in this trade agreement. Only 10,000 ton a year are allowed to export from Indonesia to Switzerland. Is that really a, a threat to the local farmer to in CH in Switzerland? Mm -hmm. Does anybody want to answer? Mm -hmm. I thought the question is whether it's a threat to the local farm in Switzerland because it's such a small amount. Yeah, I don't think so. I uh, think the, the quota are limited. The uh, the preferential quota are limited, and this is how the federal council argues. They say um, the 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 farmers in Switzerland they would not produce less rape oil afterwards, but it would just lead to a trade diversion. That you would rather import palm oil from Indonesia than from Malaysia to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. This is, but this is not clear and there is at the moment no expo, ex post evaluation foreseen in the process which would be um, helpful. Okay, another comment by uh, J, uh, JGU. Focusing on the process is something interesting and I shared that this could be a way forward but the polarization around palm oil is quite big and set people struggle with the idea of allowing alternative palm oil systems. How can we enable a different way of seeing the issues within Swiss society? Pre uh, brief answers. We only have five minutes to go and there is still a few more. Um, I know this is a big question. <laughs> yeah. yeah, go ahead. I think for me, it's not big questions, they are just humankind and quite simple questions. You know, we could promote things that we do ourselves. You can see in, 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 in Switzerland, um, uh, the, the people have basically uh, 20 hectares at most. And then basically in Indonesia, why they should be uh, four or 5,000 hectares displacing people? Then basically, if you are talking uh, about the same, you need to talk about the equivalent. Then how can we change the frame is that really, I think really refocus on more the small orders. What do you do? Is it really for their life? Does it improve their community? Does it really respect the forest? You know, just to have a, a back to basic of the meaning itself, of sustainability. You know, the the in the meaning of uh, uh, what do we want as as a society, as a whole, and and relationship with within others. You know, and then uh, that uh, people need, in fact, to get correct incomes at local level. You know, that's. That's simple like this. And therefore you can rethink the trade and rethink the sustainability itself from that local perspective. Otherwise, he, he will, uh, it's, it's, just, uh, it's just simply not uh, functioning, uh, unfortunately. Thank you very much. So the, the remaining questions here are, are largely around two, two issues. People uh, tend to be uh, rather pessimistic as uh, KS says. Uh, that an import of sustainably produced palm oil can actually be possible. And they are grappling with the idea of, so is a solution uh, to possibly to avoid palm oil altogether. There was another comment where they said, can we live without palm oil? Can we replace palm oil? Should we just get away from it? Or would it be an idea for Switzerland not to put palm oil into the trade agreement with Indonesia, but instead to include other various commodities that would allow to be produced locally by small producers and therefore respect the culture and the environment diversity. Um, another one was along the same line, uh, politically reduce, eliminate the use of palm oil. Do I understand correctly? Is that the way forward uh, you, are, you are promoting? And uh, TG is asking, how can we develop sustainable, ecological and socially just palm oil production? Um, who has to be involved and could that be in, at the international or, uh, level or a transnational process? I think this is largely the, 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 the perspective. So where can we go? If this doesn't work, what would it take instead uh, as a way forward? Because it doesn't seem to be possible within that existing frame that we have right now that you can truly produce sustainable palm oil. Is that correct or not? Yeah, of course. The, the frame as 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 uh, the frame as basically institutionalized a system that cannot work. As simple as that. 
<laughs> that that's the reality. And uh, what what we can do is just to 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 understand that, and then you know, and we need to to acknowledge the, the situation. And then, if you want to, we need to talk more about. Um, the issue about, as I say, agriculture and food sovereignty, and then we need to know what do we really need to trade uh, worldwide about it, and then to redevelop uh, more at local level here also, uh, what we talk about our own agriculture, which one do we produce here, which one do we import, and there in Indonesia, the same thing, you know, and therefore, of course, some can be traded, uh, which we can produce, cannot produce ourselves, but if you want to pr uh, trade it, then you, you make sure that uh, you, you are um, the locals on both sides uh, included, which means here the consumer and there the local actors, you know, uh, otherwise you, otherwise we never go towards any type of equity and as, as simple as that, we just, we just basically um, continue this uh, asymmetry of, of power uh, in the name of uh, sustainability, which is exactly why I found it even more uh, dangerous, that at the name of sustainability, we just continue uh, processes that are basically established since colonial time. You have to understand that uh, we just continue uh, issues that are simply existing and that were established uh, by, by, by the, the Dutch. Huh? It's, it's as simple as that. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth. I take this as a, 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 the large last round and you can um, make your last statements uh, about this and then I will close this session because we have reached our time limit. We can go on uh, if we want to, but I like to keep uh, things as planned if possible. Elizabeth. Yeah. yeah, I fully agree with, with the commenter and Denise that the problem is the focus on the specific product of palm oil. Yes, um, if you really would uh, support um, kind of sustainable trade relations between Indonesia and Switzerland, you would need to talk about a basket of products, of processed products, which can be traded uh, between both countries and which kind of um, make a shift from this post-colonial way of trading towards a new way of of trading but no trade might be a huge problem too i might uh, when for example the eu uh, restricted palm oil imports by by putting down the limits for uh, putting up the limits for um biofuel this in the biofuel law and then a lot of people uh, protested in malaysia and indonesia both small scale and large scale farmers because they say at the moment, this is our livelihood. So this is not as easy as that. And usually the, the poor countries, they're pushing for agriculture, uh, uh, for better opportunity, opportunity to export agricultural products to our countries. And this should not be forgotten. I think there must be somewhere something in between. You know, of course, in Indonesia, have, uh, they have a huge local market also to, to be developed in a better way, but here just this entry point for of the, I think the entry point of the Indonesian agreement is an interesting one, and and, and there should be a follow up process with public scrutiny, etc., to see what is will be done with this provision, and if there's some pressure to do something good out of that, why not try so kind of and take this opportunity? Okay. Thank you very much. There are no further uh, questions and comments coming in. We have reached the time. What I hear from you saying is we need trade agreements. There's nothing wrong with trade agreements and there's nothing wrong with trading. It's just within what framework and what conditions do you, do you place them? And do you give actually a choice to, to the other side? Are you dealing at, at equal levels? Um, with the partners at hand and are you inclusive or are you exclusive and focusing on specific your interests. Mm -hmm. um, with that, I think uh, if there are no urgent further needs for expressing yourselves, I would say this was a very interesting evening. Thank you very much for sharing. It must be really late now in, in, in Indonesia or in, in the Asian part of the world. So I, for that sake as well, I want to keep this and close it so that everybody can share and enjoy the evening. Thank you very much for our technical support in the background. Thank you to the speakers. And we will, I think we will repeat interesting uh, public events like this. So you will find this, um, this recording of this event at some time, at some point on our website, including uh, the presentations. Thank you.